getting unmuted. We're muting the muted. A mute, 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 mute. We're live. Oh, sorry. Getting into muted. We're getting unmuted. Now we're <laughs> mute, 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 muted. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to Between the Rolls, the Murder Hobo Inc. Uh, little talk and review show. It's me, Kyle. I didn't play any of the games, and Frank was uncooperative today, so he's like, you're doing it! <laughs> and I'm like, okay, fine. fine. Well, it was your idea for the show, so you're Be doing fair, it. all the Between the Rolls are mostly my idea. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> they are. Yes, they are. They're all, they're, all, they're all from the mind of Kyle. There's oh. a suggestion box on Discord if people wanted to put uh, things they'd like to see or they could put it on Twitter. Whoa, and whoa. Are you saying that our fans can talk to us on Twitter or on a Discord channel we have? Yeah, can you imagine that? Yeah, are there any other ways for them to follow us, Carol? Hmm, well, those are the main two. Uh, well, you know, I'm trying to think of the other ways. There's a script, us. Carol, go! <laughs> already off the script. You know, you're running the show. You go. Rude, Carol. I try to pass the ball off, you know, make you seem like you're a responsible adult. Uh, you know, more than just a D&D player, and you can't handle that. And, She's That's like, why I'm gonna have. Yeah, back right. right back at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not hosting. But anyway, if you'd rather not be watching us, you could watch us on Twitch or on YouTube. I don't know how that works for not watching us, though. Uh, anyway, what else can I say about what's going on? Um, look up Pirate Dog Dice. Uh, so good. They. <coughs> You know, I always have that line, and then I never remember it when I need to. Maybe I do have to actually, you know, take over. Jesus, man. Yeah, that's I'll, why I said. I'll, Proof I'll, that you can polish a turd. Yeah, but that's, that's tyrant. Was that that is my, my favorite saying of all time. <laughs> you can polish a turd. And that's, I love it. <laughs> no, not Paul, sure. It's a really cool resin dice. I love it. All that. right. All right. You know what? I screwed up Pirate Dog Dice. Uh, luckily, we also have a sponsorship from Oddfish Games. David, why don't you tell everyone about that? Oddfish Games, the creator of such amazing, you know, RPG accessories and actually RPGs. So, like, how, how to RPG with your cat? I believe that's one of them. They came out yeah. with uh, an adventuring cookbook type RPG uh -huh. and uh, yeah, Adventure Sense. Yeah, can't oh. can't forget Adventure Sense. Yeah, it's just like they what's fit up not your to nose like. So easy. <laughs> yeah, I think our sponsors would hate us if we did that. <laughs> yeah, sure. What you also forgot about was Shine, their new writing prompt card system that is now on Kickstarter right now. You can take a look at that, along with the How Do You RPG Your W Get What? What? I'm a little brain dead, guys, at the moment. So how are you all doing? You know, Carol, why don't you tell us about yourself, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the show. Carol, are you okay? You know, are you you feel all right there? Uh, I've got the Rona. <laughs> <laughs> Something. I don't Corona. think it's Rona, though. Like it. uh, hey, everybody. My name's Carol. Uh, I am a commission mini painter, longtime gamer, sometime GM. And um, I will take over if he freaking suddenly face plants in his garage. <laughs> Cause I don't know. Oh We're I'm not calling 911 or the ambulance. We're just no, going to take over the show for him. That's your wife's responsibility, not mine. <laughs> oh, she's entertaining you know, the I mean, mother-in-law at the moment. Come on. That's, that's, that could drive viewership right through the roof. I know. God, if you just die it's right there. How do you say terrible. Maybe it's not like terrible. terrible. <laughs> We you know, know what? Like, uh, maybe flopping around a little bit, maybe a little bit of you know, twitching, grand mall action going on. You know, I mean, you have help! To be I'm falling and I can't get up. Exactly. You know that, that that'd be cool, but you know, dying. That's a bit dark. That is a little bit dark. Uh, Scott, since yeah. you're talking, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, uh, my name is Scott. 
Uh, I've been gone for a little while because I had some things I had to get done. Um, and now um, I'm, I'm back. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. I missed all you guys very much. And we're here to talk about my favorite subject, me. What? It's true. Yeah. We're going to talk about his hair and then we're going to talk about this smoked pork shoulder he did the other day. Yes, we are. But before we get into that, we do have to introduce David. David, go ahead. Hi, I'm David. God damn it. You <laughs> I'm sorry. Me. I told you, Kyle. <laughs> I told you. No, <laughs> hi, I'm David. Uh, I am also the Bardic Scribbler on Twitter. You could catch me here on Between the Rolls and also our Thursday night show, Cacophony, our RPG soap opera. And then uh, also I appear on One Shots on Murder Hobo. So I am like the Murder Hobo neophyte, pretty much. So I don't think so anymore. I don't think so anymore now. No. Um, I think we had that Scott's taking that role again. <laughs> yeah, Scott's been going long enough. He's now the newbie. Well, yeah, that yeah, know. that's true. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah, but all my murder hobos are usually by accident. So, but you know, at least I make it look like that. Are <laughs> they by accident, though? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we had three games this past uh, couple of days: one on Thursday, one on Friday, one on Saturday, and one on Sunday. Oh, wait, Margo, what? the one shot, and of course, the days of our cacophony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, let's start off with that one. Uh, David, tell us what happened and why should I even bother watching Cacophony Soap Opera? Well, I'm because sorry. it's... Why should Scott watch it? Because honestly, he's... You got to sell it to Scott. Go. Well, Go. Scott, it's a, rip, it's a riveting, uh, you know, uh, you know, fantasy setting, you know, soap opera, you know, with rotating cast. It's just like... You never know what's going to happen. So. Now, isn't the whole point of a soap opera that you don't have a rotating cast? You have the same series. Well, we have guests. We have guests. Yeah, no, don't don't no. fuel Carol's fire, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, soap opera is like okay. They deal with like a cluster of play of characters, and then they'll do another cluster of characters. Okay, and it's a modular episodic. <laughs> yeah. It is a soap yeah, opera. shell. <laughs> there we go. Or at least two of the characters are always there every week. That is that's true. me oh, okay. and that's okay. Carrie. So <laughs> our so show's happened? producer. So anyway, yep. all right. This uh, this uh, past episode was called the Delinquent, and uh, basically to sum it up, uh, it starts off with a quest for Jabba from the Flying J. <laughs> Uh, to a meeting with the councilman to find his delinquent daughter so, who uh, robbed daddy and absconded uh, into the old city. So he hires his intrepid group of adventurers uh, known as Sadar, uh, Camilla, and no, Camille. God, why did I mess wow, that up? Come on, you've been playing with her every single Thursday for the past yeah. 20 with years. With the personas that, that Zadar changes, you know, True. the memories kind of get you know messed up. Anyway, that's why that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Sure. Anyway, uh Camille and uh the guest for that night was uh uh Daphne. Daphne was our intrepid paddle paladin from a previous episode. So uh, anyway, so we're set out to track down the troubled teen. We run into uh, more delinquent tweens. Uh, pff, turns into like an episode of Pawn Stars. We end up in a pawn shop with basically the twins from The Shining. And uh, let's see, then moves on to Thieves in the Open Market, you know, flaming carts, you know, guards getting killed, and then shadow demons yeah always shadow it always demons. ends in shadow demons yeah always so a lot of a lot of mishaps misadventures a lot of fun so uh zadar ends up you know probably in the hole for money he shelled out to recover stolen goods anyway but check out our episode folks it's in it's in the archives uh it may still be on twi on twitch so uh yeah it's a fun episode you'll love it yeah, a couple of Indiana Jones references. So. Very cool. All right. Very wow. Cool. That was quick. 
Mm-hmm. It was. Say- now you have to. It's on you now, Carol. You got this. You, you have been this. building up to the hand of Bane for months now. Scott even knew that's about it the before reason he went why on I his t- hiatus. That's the reason why I kept it short, so we can get to the main event, the hand oh, of Bane. No, I wasn't going to really go. Go, Carol, go. Job. Hand of Bane, yeah! yeah! All right, so the hand of Bane is me and four of my friends who, uh, it's an Adventurers League group of paladins. Harkens back to the Between the Roles where we talked about all paladins and how to handle an all paladin group. Well, we threw that challenge at Frank because we're all paladins with different oaths. Um, and there's five of us, so we are a hand. Uh, so our mission was to go find the acorn of the Fae, uh, which was, oh, I forget, I forget where the hell, what the name of the place, because I can't remember names for shit. But we had to basically. So are you saying you were five paladins trying to get a nut? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That, you see, that's that why I, I love Scott. I've missed him. Oh, my God. This came to me. Just stop. Sorry. So, so, sorry, Carol. Seriously. I just couldn't let that. You're searching for an acorn. I'm like, well, you're trying to get a nut. She's yeah. just a squirrel trying to get a nut. Yeah. So. No, we have. So I was going to say. Um, uh, get that from there, from there. How many of us are. Two of us, actually, there are two female. I play female character, and one of the guys plays a female character. So it's two ladies. So we are trying to get a nut, probably. Yeah. Then again, well, the other. The, let's see. The other lady, she carries around her mother, who is a little worm uh, in a like little flask thing, because she was a. I don't know the whole story behind that. I just know. That he, that she carries around her mother, in a thing, and if you listen to it, you can hear her screaming. <laughs> so, but that's I digress. It's a little dark. That is. Yeah, dark. pretty much. From it. Yeah, dark. it's the hand of Bane, of course. It's a little for a dark for Tuesday at seven, man. Man. Oh, huh. So we go. Well, it's and eight o'clock in the right place in the world, Scott. Right. It's you know, true. It is. is. Through they shut up and let me get through it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. It's been ten minutes. Carol, continue. So, so we. I let's see. I remember one of the fights was well. We go into this canyon and we see a bunch of uh, holes in the side of the canyon, and we're like, "Hmm, this is interesting and probably not very good." And sure enough, we, it was um, a bunch of rust monsters. Frank decided, Frank threw a lot of twists and turns and interesting uh, things at us that we had to be on our toes, and that was one of them. Fortunately, we are a bunch of paladins with a really good armor class and excellent saves. And the rust monsters, fortunately, did not eat any of our armor or our shiny magic weapons. Most of us had flame tongues. Uh, I had a neat shield, uh, and it was just... Thank God they didn't like hit, or the one time I did get hit, I made my save, and that pretty much was standard for everyone else. Uh, we did have, oh, we did have one, we did have one of the uh, rust monsters become essentially a roasted marshmallow, as uh, our uh, Darius took his sword. He actually managed to get to the hole before it came out, and it ran onto his sword and turned itself into a marshmallow to try to get to him. Uh, let's see. So we dispatched them anyways, and we moved on. I said, I'm just going to keep this quick. Um, it ultimately Too ended late. up. What's that? No, I was making a joke. Go ahead. <laughs> so no. it, ultimately, it ultimately ended up, in, in, we found this cave, uh, this huge cavern. Uh, and it was, I remember, it was very hot in there because there was actually a lava river. Uh, but to get to that, we had to go through another cavern which I, we all think, we don't know, but we all think that if we went across the middle, something bad would have happened. Stop that, Kyle. I'm not paying attention. You're not paying attention. Okay. <laughs> no worries then. Go ahead. Do it. Do whatever you want. Okay. So we think something bad would have happened. I didn't ask Frank. So we ran, we stuck to the sides anyways, got through that, came into this big chamber, said there was actually, I think there was a river of lava in there. There was obsidian bridges and there was some runes around it. And there was this huge statue that looked a lot like the statue on the cover of the original player's handbook. I don't know if Scott has that handy somewhere. Usually he does. But uh, 
yeah, that guy, that guy, that's, that's who was in there. So we go in there and it said, we saw some glowing runes. And as we crossed the glowing runes, all of a sudden, oh no, our connection to Bane has just suddenly been shut off. Mm. But all, we could still smite. We couldn't cast spells, but we could, I couldn't channel divinity. Um, but some of the spells worked, some of them didn't. And smiting still worked. Thank God for that. So we get in there and it didn't move. We had to basically find a way to trigger it. And Darius was the one that found the way to trigger as he climbed up and tried to pull one of the large gemstone eyes out of its socket. And then it came alive and tried to murder us. Uh, yeah, because that, that's like yeah. exactly what's going on. Yeah. So to find out the acorn, uh, the acorn, what is inside of it? We found that out with a locate object spell. Uh, we knew it was inside, so we knew we were going to have to blow it up. Uh, I remember, though, I pretty much, oh, I tried to, I tried to run back, I tried, tried to weave its threatened square for some reason. I don't remember if it was to cast spell. I don't remember what the fuck I was doing at the time. That was back on Saturday, which is, what, three days ago? So I tried to run out of its uh, threatened area, and I got basically punched in the gut and was, didn't have a hell of a lot of hit points left. So I had to actually go back on the other side of the rooms. So meanwhile, the party manages to get off the hard, crunchy exterior. And inside, there's this shadowy figure with, that I think still had the acorn in it. I am not don't re quite remember that if that was the case, but I think the acorn was still in him. And... He basically could cast fear, and Frank was, of course, this is what Frank was laughing at, uh, laughing at me at the, you know, before we came on here. I go to charge back in, and I promptly fail my will save. Everyone else made theirs, and they were fighting it, but I failed mine and go running right back the other direction. It also could possess people, and it possessed one of our members, um, but not for long because as soon as I believe it was Braun was starting to fuck with the statue, it went back to, oh, that's right. No, the acorn was behind. He went to pick up the acorn. The shadowy being popped out and went to go deal with him because he was fucking with his stuff. At least I can assume. Uh, but they defeated him before I could get back on the freaking fight. And it didn't take long because we're a bunch of freaking paladins of Bane. And I think that's that covers all the high points, um, including the parts that I'm sure that Frank wanted me to say. Oh, and of course, there was a ton of falling shale all over the place, which fortunately did not hit us when we were coming in. That's right. I almost forgot about the shale. So I think that covers all the important points. And it was fun. Um, I liked the twists and turns. I. I knew Frank was going to do uh, some stuff that we were, you know, that he said that pal being a paladin wasn't going to help us. So basically cutting off our connection to Bane, that kind of, you know, I, I, I wasn't totally surprised because of this, but the Rust Monsters was a great twist. Um, and yeah, we're like, oh, shit. Great. Here goes all our shiny weapons and magic items and stuff that we've accumulated. We're all level eight. So I think that's it. And I'll toss it back to Kyle. That uh, was great, Carol. Thanks yeah. for telling us in very quick amount of time what that happened was. on Sun Saturday. That was actually very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no. That sounds interesting. I'll, I'll, have to go and, I'll have to go and watch that. I, I, would, I would like to see how the rust monsters and uh and uh and a whole group of paladins work together no, I'm serious that. No, you I, say I, rust I, monster oh, i'm just imagining this rust monster swarm that i created in a one shot and how uh yeah. eric called justice man handled that one yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, i'm shit. recalling the song by the 50 b52s rock I, lobster and substituting it. rust monster <laughs> so monster right. yeah it works yeah, I could totally, I could, to, it totally felt like the others and I were going, oh shit, what do we do? And then, then when I realized Frank's dice were going to roll for shit, I was like, ah, it's no problem. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. Y'all got lucky. Uh, you know what? Speaking <laughs> of dice rolling for shit, let's try this one more time. Guys, I want to tell you about Dirty Dog Dice. Oh! Uh, you should pre-order their dog poop dice. Proof you can... Polish a turd. You are such. There a we go. 
That's what? cool. Kyle, you were such an asshole. It's pirate dog dice. Pirate dog dice. Right. She does not make turd dice. Sure she does. Oh, I, I have a, a set of I dice know. in the making. You dog turd dice. Proof you, you can polish a turd. You can. That's already been done. That's already been proven you can. Yeah, <laughs> but who actually watches Mythbusters anymore? No. <laughs> ah, no. Oh, don't go there right now. <laughs> That's right. I went there. Anyway, guys, uh, Frank's not here to talk about the uh, uh, Sunday Margu campaign, uh, and we'll explain why that is later. Uh, but suffice to say that the Frank's family and extra uh, went adventuring through and with their terrible NPC, Phineas. Latrec uh, eating so many bananas that he had diarrhea and ruined many, many a opportune social interaction for the party. <laughs> it might be uh, an interesting thing to watch, especially because I'm pretty sure Frank himself had diarrhea as he was pretending to be the character. What? I know, right? Well, where do you think they get the dog poop dice from? Anyway. <laughs> dog! It is 8.20. I think this is the earliest we've ever gotten to a topic in a long, long time. Keep so going. everyone, you clap, like pat you your off. shells on the shoulder. Go ahead, Carol. Carol, yeah? There you go. All right. I so, I'm a dick on chat right now. We go dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, anyway, uh, tonight we're talking about... Uh, um, with 5e being at six years now uh and then just the kind of topic that's been brought up is you know what do we expect from 6e or hmm. do we expect maybe a 5.5 how long is this era going to last and what do we want to see in the next thing now a lot of that is looking back into the past seeing what we have done to see what we could get into the future and then just discussing about what we like and don't like about uh, 5e in general right now, which is why Frank's not here, because we want to be constructive about it. And we all know Frank would just say, 5e sucks, 2e. Yeah, he and, would. And uh, that's why we've blocked him and prevented him from uh, <laughs> being in front of the camera today. And you'll and thank We discussed him. that last week, too. <laughs> right? Now, Problem watching. players. <laughs> Watching and being the peanut gallery making comments on Twitch chat. So that's why you should watch, you know, so you can read his funny comments. It's called Scala Dick. <laughs> Gosh, at least, you know, I'm I'm helpful when I'm in the comments, you know. I spread word about the sponsors. Oh, yeah. I mentioned something. Dibble Thibbet. <laughs> Dibble Thibbet. Dibble, Dibble Thibbet. Thibbet's delivery service. You Dibble Thibbet it, we deliver it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we even talk about going into sixth edition, or at least maybe a little bit talking about it, let's go back to our earliest memories, um, which for me is fifth edition. So we're going to skip over me. <laughs> we'll go with the uh, oldest person here, Carol. What? Uh, what? Am I the oldest <laughs> person here? <laughs> I know them. <laughs> God has. God has me beat. <laughs> Scott, you were uh, second edition, right? Any uh, earlier was, than that? I was basic. All yes. right. Well, let's start with basic then. Scott, we have 6E coming in the future at some point, potentially. What are some things that happened over in uh, basic D&D &D that you like that you would like to see pulled forward? Uh, what can either of you guys hear? Yeah. Hold on a second. Something just ad just popped up on my thing in there. I was like, <laughs> weird. The voice was it for Odd Fish Games? No, it was for Fruit Cups. It Ooh, wasn't for You know what? I could use a Fruit Cup right now. We could all use a Fruit Cup right now. Uh, um, no, we, what, what was interesting about Basic, and it's not anything I would like to bring up. There are certain things that I think could be useful moving forward, um, you know, in basic and, uh, and then the expert set and the uh, master set and the immortal set, whatever. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of things I think that, you know, first edition, you know, would, would, would benefit bringing back, but not really anything so much in basic because structurally basic 
um, was what was too simple. Um, and I think the game is now advanced to the point where people enjoy enough of the complexity that basic is good to go back every now and then as a, as a trip down memory lane, as a, as a nostalgia. Um, you could start a character, just literally all you need was, was, a, was a piece of paper and three, and three dice um, to roll up your character. And, and that's it. And, you know, you just wrote it up and I, I still have some old pieces of paper. You do, you just kind of write your characters, three die six. Those were your, you know, your, your characteristics. And then you were, um, your class was the same thing as your race. So an elf was a race and a class. Uh, if you were a human, then you were, um, you were a magic user, a thief or a, uh, or a fighter or a cleric, and then a halfling was a class and a race, et cetera. So a dwarf was a class and a race. So it, it, it was it was very simplistic in that idea. You normally had your equipment was two or three things that you start off with, a torch, backpack, uh, a weapon, and some armor, and you were off. So I, I like the simplicity of it. It was easy to start. A lot of people started with Keep on the Borderlands, um, the, the classic dungeon crawl. So there's a lot of... You know, there's a lot to love in its simplicity and the fact that you had a great imagination. But I think that 5e captured that. Um, they went back, in essence, to get away from a lot of the, um, you know, hyper gaming and uh, the focus on all the numbers and that you had in the, in the fourth edition. Got back to just the, the storytelling side of it. Um, which I thought was a strength of uh, of the basic edition and the expert, and then the uh, you know immortal set. But we've grown up past that, and so I don't think that we, there's anything that additional that can be brought from the early basic editions uh, back through to any future editions. That that's my opinion. From any of the past editions, or are we talking first? Just and basic. basic from okay. from from one e. Mm -hmm. There's one real specific thing that I want to be brought back, and that yeah. is I want the idea of certain NPCs can be hit not just by magic weapons, but by more powerful magic weapons. I've never liked the idea that a demon lord uh, that, you know, has you know, immunity to or resistance to all weapons that are not magical that you, that a you know a third or fourth level character can can pick up a plus one sword, uh, and you know be able to actually damage a uh, a, a, a CR twenty character a CR twenty uh, just it, that, that it used to be you know plus three or greater or plus four or greater certain things was a had you had to hit him only one sword could hit him a plus five holy avenger. Now, I think that that starts to get into these things that people were didn't like about the earlier editions, that it was too complex, it was too number-focused. Mm. So I like the idea of still making it class-specific on certain weapons, but I think they ought to invent a class of weapons for an artifact class and have your super high-level legendary characters that they're resistant to everything. You know, it's not just magical. It has to be a magical artifact-level weapon. So you have... Magical weapons, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus all that's are magical weapons. Plus four is an artifact. And certain monsters can only be damaged by that or higher. So, or, 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 or can only, it's not, they wouldn't be higher, but an artifact level weapon. So, um, a, a, you know, a Baylor, a uh, ancient red dragon, a uh, demon lord, um, mm -hmm. you know, a solar. Certain creatures, certain NBCs um, that had three legendary actions and were just super, super powerful, they can only be hit by artifacts, period. Sure. Okay. Uh, with that first edition, Dave, Carol, anything to say or should we move up the editions? You have to move up. I didn't play first. I started. 2E. <laughs> yeah, I'm 2E. Why, you want I'm, to I was basic, but I. Did not stick Didn't. with the game, so you know. <laughs> Apparently, there was some stuff that was okay being left in the past. Is what I'm hearing from David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Carol, we two. move on to second edition. So, so two e. Uh, wait, wait. Sorry, what's the exact question again? 
The question is, you know, if we are making 6E, let's say we are going to be the four game designers for 6E, what are you taking from second edition? What are you bringing into sixth edition? Honestly, um, not much. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I love playing, but a lot, I think a lot of times too, it's your G, if you have good GMs, it doesn't matter what system, how bad the system is, sure. they can make it great. You know, uh, and I think that was a lot of it. Um, when I really think back to it, there's a lot of things I'm not crazy about in 2E. I did not like Thago. Uh, it's just, I had to have a chart written on my friggin' paper of what I was hitting on because how do you figure out quickly, you know, with the minus 10 armor, we have the sliding scale and it's like, oh God. So I'm, don't miss that. I do like skills better than I liked, uh, the non-weapon proficiencies and such. And it's funny thing is back when, before I transitioned over, I'm like, I looked at skills and I'm like, eh, I'm not too sure about it, but. I totally love them now. But I mean, I love the non-weapon. I thought it was great for flavor, I said. Um, the one thing, okay, the one thing, and I'm gonna get a ration of shit for this probably. The one thing I've missed <clears throat> from second ed was the way bards could go around and pick up spell books, they could pick up scrolls and they could learn uh, any arcane spell. That was their spell list, is, was arcane spells. They could learn wizard spells uh instead of having their own thing and i thought they had a bit more firepower because of and i thought they were a little more fun to play because of that i was happy when fifth ed uh gave bards that you know the ability where we can pick up a couple of wizard spells but it was kind of fun to have a little bit smaller you know maybe you had a, you had a smaller list than a wizard but you could still cast their spells and you were not you were a reasonable fighter too and I feel like you sort of lost a bit of both of that in the newer editions. That's like the one thing I really kind of wish they would they would delve into. Or maybe even, you know, more damage through harmonics or sonics or things like that. That would be cool too. But that's not that would be looking forward to six dead or whatever. But I guess it's it. I said I did enjoy it. I didn't hate it, but there definite there was this not a lot like like uh, Scott said, there's not a lot I would actually carry forward because I like the system the way they have it now. I like it that it is a lot simpler and a lot quicker, you know, to do the math to figure out um, whether or not you've hit or not. You know, so Thaka was just such a pain in the ass. And I don't know too many other people who, thought, who think it's better. I don't think there's anyone who thinks that's better. But, or, or how about the um, experience levels? Everyone had different levels and you got XP for, fine, if you were a thief, for how many, you know, how much you stole. And if you were a fighter, how much you, you know, killed. And, and everyone had different, and, and of course, everyone had needed different levels of experience to go up. And I just, uh it was it was it was a train wreck. That part was a. You don't real think that would have brought in a little bit more role playing if the well obviously. I think thieves it always steal, but if the fighter was training to get those levels, if the wizard actually had to take spell scrolls, put them in a spell book in order to gain that next level, you don't I, think that would be a nice nah, way to. Nah. No. Nope. I think uh, role playing such should be that should be more or less um, based on what the players want to do and what the GM encourages. I think it's up to the GM to encourage role-playing or to help encourage role-playing. Um, and I don't, you know, and role-playing is its own reward. Um, I mean, maybe there's some people out there probably don't agree with me who definitely like the fighty, crunchy numbers, rolling dice aspects. Um, so the I've, problem it, players we were talking about <laughs> last Tuesday. I'm not dissing, not dissing anybody who likes that. That is a valid way to play the game. She thinks you probably play a tabaxi sorcerer or something. Something yeah. like that. I, you know, maybe yeah. I'll yeah. roll one of those up. All right, Scott, did you have anything else to add to 2E perchance? Or? I think that Dave's turn to talk now. Uh, really, sorry, I Dave. don't have <laughs> much much. Well, I really don't have anything to add as far as mm -hmm. 2E or any of the uh, additions up to 5E because, like I said, I mean, uh, I started in the game with basic, 
kind of kind of went into advanced and then life happened <laughs> and then uh, D &D planet. and here I am you know middle-aged and I'm coming back into the game and you know it's you know it's an all new learning experience uh, right. I have some memories of the beginning you know Scott brings up a lot of stuff and it just memories keep flooding back but uh, well, but yeah it, so or pour more scotch into it Exactly. It'll drown yeah, it out. Throw more scotch into it. Yeah, the, the, the one thing I would add, uh, and it kind of dovetails is what Carol was saying about mm -hmm. the specialization that you had within your within your classes. Mm -hmm. 2E was, I think, probably most, at least what I remember 2E most about is you had the, you know, the complete handbooks, right? The yeah. complete Bard's handbook, right? Oh, the gosh. complete Fire's handbook, the complete yeah. book of Elves, complete book of... So All you had... Problems. Right, right. You had all the specialization that really went into the detail of um, how to customize your characters. Now, I thought that that kind of set the stage for the over complexity that I think plagued, you know, the uh, later editions before they simplified back when they did um, uh, five, uh, five, eight. However, I do like some of the some of the specialization that you could do um, it made the characters a little bit maybe more personalized um, and each one of them had each character each class had uh, had its strengths and weaknesses now the Thaco or uh, and some of the math and the number crunchy parts of it I, I agree with Carol there um, I I, I, I I wasn't really a fan. I, I I enjoyed doing it, but after a while, when you're in combat and you have six or seven players, the it just it becomes comes too comes too much. So um, I wouldn't mind possibly seeing a modification to how to how different classes advance. I wouldn't bring back Thaco, and I wouldn't bring back you know the over specialization, showing how you know this is better at this or this is better at that. But maybe I would make some slight modifications, and this is how I would do it still within the way the 5e thinks, to like bounded accuracy. So the idea that um, you know you should have some caps on your on your ability scores. I wouldn't mind the idea, for instance, that that a um, that the class of a mad of a wizard, for instance, you know, couldn't get past 18, right? or the uh, class of anything that's not a dwarf can't get past 19, or the charisma of anything other than a bard not get past 18. So I wouldn't mind having some harder limits on, on, some, of the, um, on, on, on some of the abilities to make a stronger link between that to where you have maybe a little bit more a little more class distinction, you know, between between the different classes and races that, uh, and really not really so much races, but probably, probably more along with classes because you, if you really did spend your entire life learning the arcane arts, then, and you're really, really strong in, uh, in your intelligence, if you really have honed your mind, to, you know, then, then I doubt that you're gonna be doing the work it takes to, to keep a fantastic physique uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, so while you can always add, and that's that add part where, you know, every four or five levels, you can add a couple of ability points. What about you kind of tone that down and you give some stronger caps? I, I mean, I'm a DM, so I want to nerf the players, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So maybe five E makes the, uh, heroes a little bit too heroic and maybe you want a little bit more darker grittier uh, uh a little play bit style. More, yeah maybe and really more. pitching them into the roles and you know feel free to take over for what i'm saying but saying yeah. you know your wizard is the intelligent one and that is his role in the party the rogue isn't going to come in over here and step on everybody's toes you have your part to play, and this is a group tabletop game. You're going to play it by these hard limits that we're going to put in. Today. Yeah, and, and and it's maybe it's, I mean you can always have the flexibility to play something the way you want to. 
Um, but I, I just think that, you know, that, that there used to be prime requisites, right? That's, that's, I guess that's what I'm talking about. Maybe is that idea of you have a prime requisite. They, they, they did the idea of, you know, you have proficiency, you add your proficiency to these, to these certain classes, right? Well, I'm, I'm of the idea that you can't get past an 18 unless you can add your proficiency to that, right? That, 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 that would be a way to, to structure that. So if, if you're, uh, if you're a wizard and you add your proficiency to, um, to add your proficiency to intelligence, that way, as far as being able to score for role for, you know, checks and saves and such as that, um, and all the skill checks that are also associated that are linked to intelligence. Well, my point there is that your ability score can't be above an 18 unless you have, unless you can add your proficiency to it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, 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 that in essence becomes your prime attribute. And, and so, so you can't get above an 18. That's, that would be one thing I would kind of bring back is the idea of a prime attribute that's associated with the class. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Carol, you look like you had a thought. <laughs> no. <laughs> we do. going out. Dagger. No, no. Yeah, but we do have that already since each, each, maybe not in the way you're talking about, but each class does have a prime stat that you should focus on. You know, like how the, the fires is charisma um, and sorcerers uh, are all charisma. Uh, you know, fighters of strength or deck. I think striders is fighter strength or decks are just strength. Both. Remember, but it is both. Yes. Um, you know, rogues is decks. It, it, sure. it, there is still a prime stat there that you do tend to want to focus on. I think he does want to just kind of nerf the other ones and maybe make an actual dump stat part of the rules. Like, yeah, no, if you're a paladin, you're great at strength, you're great at charisma, you have a decent constitution, but you have to dump either intelligence or dexterity. Yep. Choose. And usually, and you know what? Most players, I think most players uh, do anyways. Always intelligence. But the idea is that as you advance through... As you advance to what people then do is then you get into metagaming and they say, okay, I uh, dumped, um, you know, where I'm, where I'm crap in wisdom, but as you get further up, you know, that that's, you don't, you don't like that. So every three or four or four or five levels, you put two points to wisdom, two points to wisdom, two <laughs> points to wisdom, two points. And, and then by the time you're 15th level, now you have 20 wisdom. And I'm thinking, Pretty soon, you you see stat lines that are just like you know nineteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, nineteen, eighteen. But wait, are you saying this character's wisdom is their prime stat or not their prime stat? It's not their prime stat, and because yeah. it's not their prime stat, they can't advance it past a certain level. Well, and I the trick that Five E and some of the previous editions have done is by giving you optional feats, so you don't always get to choose those. Uh, ability score increases, which is yeah. where I'm segueing into 3.5 and Pathfinder. Oh, 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 oh. you went yeah, I there. I just started reading this book you and went I'm like, there. holy crap, there are so many feats. Which version of Pathfinder? One or two? That's Tui, the <laughs> Humble Bundle, and I was like, $10 and I can get the player's handbook? Oh, you get the whole, uh, hell yeah. the whole rule book? Yeah, I'll, I'll pay $10. It goes mostly to charity. I don't think any of them are actually charities, but you know, whatever. Uh, but we have three, three, five or 3.5. And then of course the branch off that is Pathfinder, which has been, as I understand it, the most skill heavy feet, heavy monstrous mess that I have ever seen in my entire life. But <laughs> with it, talk about meta. Yeah, right? No. I mean, honestly, if I were to imagine what went on in everyone's brain, it was, yeah, you know, the DM's in charge of your basic D&D, &D, your first edition, second D&D, &D, and someone had awful DM's every single thing, and they were like, all right, we're going to make third edition, and we're going to make sure that your DM can't screw you over. We're going to put in 
rules to everything. You need to swim across a dangerous river. This is the DC that you use for that river. You have to climb. If you have a rope, it's a DC five check. You can do it. And it really bogged down everything as far as I can tell. But it made uh, uh, an amazing thing where you really get to choose how your characters come back. There's, and every level you can do something new and interesting that separates you out. If you have two thieves starting at the same thing and they can go straight up in a line in the same archetype and you can still end up with two incredibly different styles of thieves and assassins. Uh, And a part of me wants to see that and a part of me wants to see all those skill sets. Uh, But that really is not simplicity. That is 5E. And so, I don't know. What do you guys have to say about it? And Dave, I think 3.5 Pathfinder is a enough talked about subject. Let's hear what you might have to say on it. On 3.5? 3.5 or Pathfinder. I know Carol talks about Pathfinder all the time, so you should be able to come up with something. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, just uh, from the... The way that you described uh, Pathfinder and 3.5 and all that sounds incredibly complicated, but I mean, there are people that thrive on that. And, um, you know, it's like you said, having DC set for every little thing. I mean, yeah, that could be overwhelming, but um, I do like the the idea of the, the way that, uh, like you said, that you could have two of the same class and so many different options where, you know, even though you progress together by, by the end, you have two completely different types of thieves, you know, and um, you know, it's things like that, that, that I enjoy. You do get some of that in 5e, but not as much as, as you would get it in Pathfinder or 3.5. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you know, I mean, that 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 was pretty much the meat and potatoes of 3.5 was just, you know, you create your character and you make it your own. You know, you, you know, you had just, more choices. So. You're, you're, you're right. You're you're 100 percent correct there. Do you so. want me to take it or? I said, yeah, of course, I'm I, I, for it, Carol. I played Go ahead. with it before I play ready. Pathfinder. I played Pathfinder because I really didn't play fourth ed and also had friends who played uh, the organized play. The one thing I'm going to say about all the DCs now, a, a lot of Pathfinder, a lot of the money they make are on their, their published scenarios and a lot of their organized play stuff. So you're not, as a GM, it's not as bad as you think because all those DCs are right in the module for you mm-hmm. so it's not it's not really that complicated um i think it's more complicated if you were writing the scenario you're doing a home brew at home uh where you have to actually set those dcs yourself but if you're prepping i mean if you you know usually you prep before your sessions i know granted there are groups that send you know the plot off the rails you know i wouldn't know anybody around here who does that oh right all of us um <laughs> Bibs and lies. It's hard. It's hard if you're coming up with it on the fly. But uh, for the most part, I never really thought it was like social encounters and such really took all that long uh, and were overly complicated. I know it looks on the surface a little bit. It it definitely is a bit more crunchy and a bit more complicated than 5e. May I, Carol? Let me go through. I'm Go. looking at the Druid spell class right now. Yeah. Uh, when you make your character, you kick your ancestry. Yeah, and then maybe. let's see. Oh, hold on. Oh, shoot. Wow. I have to spend so many pages just to figure this stuff out. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. I should have gone with an easier one. Okay. No. Second level. You have Druid feats. And right. you get those every even numbered level. Also right. at second level, you get skill feats. You get that every, I don't know when. Then at third level, you get general feats. And it's feats here and feats here. (laughs) I mean, I absolutely love it because I like 
crushing through all those things, but just opening it up and looking at a class and being like, wait, I get 800 feet at third level. That's amazing. But each feet does it. They're, they're different types. Um, you know, the, it, right. they're not as, I don't think they're as broken as like the feats in th and three, you know, 3.0, 3.5 and Pathfinder one. Sure. They're, you know, some of them, I mean, the skill feats, basically they help you with, with certain skills, you know, um, mm. you know, and you get more the general feats i think to more help towards fighting and your class feats of course that has something i think that builds a little class flavor mm -hmm. uh by the way i ended <laughs> i ended up getting hero lab online which is pathfinder's version of D, &D beyond yeah and i find that very helpful <laughs> because you're right it does look very intimidating on the surface for second ed um so the one of the questions was, what would you bring? All right, if I was going to come up with yeah. my new uh, sixth edition version, uh, if Are I was going to bring gonna any of that clutter up, I would. Nope, there's a, a mechanic I would bring, and it's, mm -hmm. I think it's the best mechanic yet. Is the three action economy? I love the way they do actions. You get three actions. That now, granted, there's there's some. Uh, spells or a mm -hmm. lot of spells and such that take up more than action, one action and it's spelled out for you in the spell. Uh, there's some abilities that take more than one. You just have to look. But basically you get three actions and you can use them in uh, however you want. So, But some of the things that used to be free like um, making knowledge checks and, like Pathfinder, you can make a knowledge check to try to figure out the monsters. Uh, that now takes an action when before in Pathfinder 1 it didn't. But I, I agree with that. And I always wonder why it didn't take any actions to figure out what this monster was. I guess it was you knew it or you didn't. Um, but that's the that would be the big thing I carry over. But they probably have it, you know, copyrighted or trademarked or whatever. And uh, D and D probably can't steal that one from Pathfinder. But the three action economy, I, I really, 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 really like. I also like the way they handle death now and death and dying and such, but that's another point. That's and another thing. That's their sixy. We're making our sixy, but let's no, steal their three like, action economy. That would be the one thing I'd steal for our sixy. I All really right. do. That. Scott, sure? real quick. Anything from 3.5 Pathfinder? Oh. <laughs> no, I, I um, at that point when I was, um, that's about the point I dropped off. When I saw the three, five stuff, I said, as a DM, this is hell and gave up. <laughs> <laughs> what? Could be fairly accurate. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's jump up to 4E. I don't have anything on 4E. I actually recently picked up its Dungeon Master Guide and I've been reading through it and there's some things I like in there so far. But uh, Carol, um, I played a God, little. Dave, you have anything on 4E or no? Not much. I played it when it first came out, and then they started dicking with the rules with the Rada, and we're like, "Fuck this!" If they're gonna keep publishing new rules every six months, and we say, "Let's go play Pathfinder." Yeah. Uh, Sounds yeah right. Or three point five. I think actually it was three point five. It was at a convention when I get dragged off to play pop. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's where it all started. <laughs> the whole thing of what people said it felt like playing a video game was absolutely true. Um, I did. I sat there and I said, I feel like we need like uh, placemats with the freaking abilities on it that we're punching, you know, as we use it. Because I'm like, it feel it does feel a, like a, a B A down left right. Pretty yeah. much. Um, I will say this. There is one thing I will definitely uh, think they did a, a good job on was the fact that, and I think both Pathfinder 2 and D&D &D picked up on this, is the fact that they made wizards and other casters a lot better at low levels. Like, you know, you go back to second ed, you had your, like your one spell and one slot. And, and you better you had a crossbow with you. <laughs> yeah, or, or a staff. Um, mm -hmm. it was probably better because you had like what four hit points, something like that. Yeah, only, Loved it. only do you have four <laughs> hit points, so you're a little hardier. But excuse me, <clears throat> I snarfed my drink. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's what that was. Um, 
but not only did you have more hit points, especially if you were a wizard, uh, but you also have you also have what now is the cantrips. I forget what they were called back then, but they were spells you could pretty much cast. Every, you wouldn't run out. You just keep casting them over and over and over again. Um, but so at least you could still cause some damage. Even if it's not great damage, you could still at least cause some damage instead of being there, standing there with your crossbow missing because you're <clears throat> you're proficient you're, because your proficiency is terrible. Actually, I don't think wizards were proficient in crossbow, were they? It was like sling and darts. I think is what they had. Yeah, it. Slings and darts. That's it. I mean, it said if you didn't have that, well, you're shit out of luck. So I think I think at some point they introduced the hand crossbow as well. Oh, maybe I don't don't recall the hand that. Crossbow. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of I've been playing a lot of years, so it really isn't shocking that I forget that. But that's I think that's one of the best things that did carry over is the fact that spellcasters became better and more. Yeah. It's, it, it, I would have been I would have been totally bored in the old edition just having that one spell and that's it. You know, it, I think that that definitely improved the game a lot for those classes. So yeah. that's my little bit about fourth. But I don't really I didn't really play a lot of it. I don't think a lot of people played. I don't a think lot a lot of, of people. No, <laughs> that, well, yeah. Let's see. Uh, fourth came out in two thousand eight, and I don't know. Six years later, fifth edition. Holy crap. Yeah, and they. So started, yeah, yeah. It, six uh, edition is right around the corner, guys. No. <laughs> We're designing no, it here. Yeah. There's, <laughs> anyway. There's a big difference between the fourth and fifth, and that is only people love people love fifth, True. and did not like, and not many people like fourth. So I do I I foresee it. If we I believe that was a question on the thing. I foresee it that this is going to go for a while, and I hope it does. That'll be our last remarks, Carol. Hold on. <laughs> Let's get to that real fast. Scott, David, did you have anything to add on 4E or not at all? No. You know, like I said, uh, it was my experience with 4E is <laughs> for you. We're going to start with you <laughs> next day. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, just, I just have one quick comment. 4E <laughs> was for DMs what 3-5 was to players. It just complicated the DM's role to try to compensate for giving the uh, players that many actions and that that much stuff to do. Sure. So the entire system got unwieldy and and pretty much impossible. And as Carol said, it felt like a video game. It, it really like did. You you, it, it, it felt like you weren't in control anymore. You, now the rules were in control. So it yeah. used to be you have all of that player functionality, all that player power. And then they tried to equalize it on the DM side. And that's just, I'm pressing these the buttons and you're pressing these buttons and you're pressing and all of the creativity, all of the storytelling, everything got out. It just got to be, okay, I'm going to throw this thing and it's going to be B, B, A, B, B. And the player said, well, I'm going to throw this thing. It's C, C, A, B, B. And when C, C, A, B, B gets to A, B, 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 what's the result of that? <laughs> Cabbage and, and, patch and, and, dolls. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it was it was just a mess. It was a mess. But I like the idea about what Carol said about action economy because that I think gets to what if there is going to be one thing that can be gleaned from that whole four e five e. Um, sorry, sorry, from the whole three five to four e that could be incorporated future into future editions is the idea of how to modify action economy. A little bit cleaner, a little bit clearer. Um, Actually, I want to add something to this. Okay, so I was thinking about D and D essentially <laughs> does three acts. Correct. But they're defined. You have. Both. I'm going to interrupt Carol here. I'm letting you all know we're going a little long tonight. Oh, maybe but, 10, 15 minutes, but go ahead, Carol. Go. No, maybe <laughs> didn't. Not because of you, Carol. Save my piece. I we wouldn't go long. So. All right, so basically you have bonus actions, move actions, and you know, uh, your standard action. With Pathfinder, they made it so that any no, actions do not have a definition anymore. It's either an action that costs one action to do, an action that costs two, or some cost three. That's it. That's the only defining thing anymore. That you can put it in whatever order you want. If you want to move and hit something and move again, you can do that. 
You know, that's, I think it's a lot more flexible. I said, I was thinking about, I'm like, Dean, well, wait, D and D still has three actions, but they're, but they're so defined, maybe a little less definition. That's what I wanted to. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that maybe some of that can be incorporated um, in, into what you have in 5e that wouldn't require that much just by tweaking what things fall within the baskets, because what they happen, you know, cantrips, for instance, um, getting to your <coughs> point about making lower level characters a little bit, you know, more powerful, giving them something that doesn't doesn't run out on, on your caster classes. I think that you need to have class specific feats and or spells. So cantrips and um, smites for paladins. Those are the only bonus actions you have, period. Those are the only bonus actions. And then you incorporate a, a, a type of uh, use. Well, I, let me say one other thing. Class specifics, so cantrips, um, your lower level stuff, your smites for your, for your, uh, for your paladins, um, and, and let's say a help action. Is, those are things that can be defined as bonus actions, okay? Everything else, if you're using an object, you're using a weapon or making an attack or casting a spell, that's a full action. And then you have your third being your um, being your move, uh, being your move action. So you have a use, a bonus, and a move. And I, you, so you still get three, but they're still they're defined. I just don't like ideas of saying when you have certain you know full on spells, they're bonus actions. I think they need to re get rid of the thing called a reaction. Um, it just I just don't like that. It becomes four actions. And I don't know. I, I don't know how to exactly do it, but I like the simplicity that I think 3.5 and Pathfinder brought to action economy. And I would like to see a revamp in 6E. I was brainstorming there about how it could be done. I don't know the way to do it. Um, but I, I, I agree with Carol that well, I think action economy needs to be revamped. Pathfinder does still have reactions. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I don't like reactions. Reactions, really... reactions are made to fuck with DMs. Period. Yeah, that's <laughs> and that's why they gave the DMs legendary actions yeah, and like... reactions. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't yeah. like legendary actions. I don't. I don't like legendary actions. Uh. -uh. I, I. I don't. I, I draw up my high-powered PCs as if they had the NPCs as if they had a class, and and I and I don't give them legendary actions. I give them lair actions but not yeah. legendary actions. Yeah. That's fine. And that's fine. But I, I think way reactions work, I can't really see them being used as any, I mean, they Pathfinder actually tried it when they were play testing 2.0 of you would have to save an action to use a reaction. And it was just too difficult because basically you're leaving an action on the table in the hopes that something that will trigger that one thing you can do, like raise a shield or shield block, you know, it, it does, it just doesn't work. It works. It actually is fine to have that fourth action. And I mean, and, and Pathfinder two is a pretty tough, it can be a very tough game. I mean, I've seen the guy basically he's the game director. He runs a couple of games on certain right now. He only runs one game on stream. And that being said, you shouldn't watch that one. You should just watch Murder Hoboing. You should watch it. <laughs> but yeah, he's almost TPK'd his party. I mean, that's how tough it can be. And I played one of the scenarios that he wrote, and it's it can be very tough on the players. It's not it's challenging. We give that it. to the new edition jitters, new yeah. edition walking legs, you know, like a baby. All right. I'm gonna get off of you two right now. Or you two can get on each other in some other area. David, it's all about you. 5E. Let's go. Everyone who <laughs> watches it, plays it. Mm -hmm. So what have you noticed in your time playing 5th edition that you're really enjoying right now? I mean, as these two have said, it's been simplified from the past couple of editions, but not as simple as very beginning, trying to make it user-friendly. Um, but a lot of what I've noticed is that those very specific DCs are gone. And mm -hmm. I think personally, I feel like fifth edition is Swiss cheese. There's huge holes in gameplay 
that the writers expect you as a DM to fill. And right. so your overall fifth edition, let's not talk about me. <laughs> well, it, I, I believe you're absolutely right that there are intentional holes into the mechanics and all that, that you as a DM have to fill. And, um, and uh, also I feel also that players have compared to what I know about uh, previous editions, uh, players and character creations, you have a lot of latitude now. Mm. And I, I see that as going forward to sixth edition. Um, you know, one of the things that I enjoy doing isn't so much min maxing a character. It's uh, it's just character exploration, you know, you know, creating a character classes, subclasses, feats, things like that. Um, and Scott's like, <laughs> no, I, was thinking, I like to min min a character. Yeah, but I like that that 5e has kind of simplified that, right. and you know, and uh, has placed like a lot of the min maxing whatever into racial racial abilities as well as feats and things like that. That's where you get your, you know, your different modifiers for proficiencies and things. So I mean. You know, that's what brought me back into the game was that simplicity. Because when my friends asked me to play, you know, it's just like, oh, come on, Dave, we're, we're having a D&D night. And I was just like, oh, God, you know, because, <laughs> you know, I heard how complicated the previous editions were. And, you know, when I came back and they handed me the, the handbook to look through it and I looked at character creation and all that. And I was like, OK, I can do this. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I mean, going forward, uh, I mean, I, I, I see that's going to carry over probably into sixth edition. And that was my draw into the game and all that. Now, as I've gotten to play, I, I haven't really had a lot of experience DMing, but I mean, I can see that the tools are a little, uh, you don't have as large a toolbox as you had in previous editions for, for DMs, but I mean, they work that that's the thing i don't think your dm is you know too pigeonholed and all that i think i think a lot of 5e may have freed up things for the dm it's just like yeah. you know that's up for you for the players to decide you know so yeah. but i mean that's my take on it right now i mean if we go into discussing uh sixth edition and what comes in uh what's coming next i mean um you know we can get into that and but a lot of it, I think, uh, a lot of the holes that that you described uh, as existing in Five E, mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're ever going to get filled. I mean, going forward, you know, there might be some here oh, and there. Come on, so. I was thinking to myself, you know, <laughs> what I'm missing most from Fifth Edition, uh, and this is me only starting in Fifth Edition, and then I go back and I read some of the older stuff just to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think the Dungeon Master's Guide is missing a lot of those building blocks that if you had started Dungeon Master sooner, I mean, even in 4E, mm -hmm. they have a lot of those building blocks. You know, hey, this is what Dungeoneering looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, David and I know you and I listen to the same uh, podcast, same YouTubers, and that's yeah. something that gets talked about is like, you know, 5th edition doesn't talk about what an exploration round is or turn is right. You know, when you're dungeoneering, every action that the party takes is 10 minutes and what happens during that 10 minutes. Or if you're exploring a hex, this is four hours of your day traveling from this one hex to this hex or doing whatever you want to do in that hex. Right. And a lot of that does not get mentioned at all or anything like that. And I personally would, You'd like I think to see if you it. do make a sixth edition, you need to make that out there or mm. at least have a large enough space. It's like, yeah, when your party is dungeoneering, you know, something is going to happen between every five or 15 minutes. Here's an idea of what could happen. Or, you know, sure. Hey, instead of building your own economy, which I kind of feel like you have to do, mm -hmm. it's like, well, here. This is what a low magic economy like look like. A barrel of ale might go for a copper piece in trade. Or in a high magic economy where it's a magic barrel of ale, it's going for 10 gold because of this or this. And I would just love to see like at least three examples and everything 
And maybe that's bogging it down a little bit, but I think that should only be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Right. Just for the Dungeon Master to see and be like, okay, I like this. I like, yeah. I like my explorations to be like this, but I like my economy to be like this. And we're doing a high magic world, so I'll kind of borrow from this. And so I like the idea of it being simplified, but maybe not as simple as it is. Uh, Mm -hmm. Carol, Mm -hmm. let's hit you first, but let's make it a little bit quick. This isn't final thoughts yet, but 5e, what do you like about it? What do you not like? And what do you want carried over to 6th edition? Oh, God. I I like most of it. Um, I agree with you on, I agree with you there, actually, that for world building and for constructing your own games, that you're right, they probably could add some more information and some of that stuff. Um, I have said I've only run like one game, so I haven't really, and I haven't really delved into the DMG. Um, oh, come on. But I don't know, to carry, I, I care, I don't know, I carry over most of it. I think the one thing I'd really like to see, but I mean, I could see them still doing it within this edition too. I will, I'd like to see more character options. Let's face it, sorry, yeah, I play that other game which we talked about, but I like the fact that they do have a lot of different character options, more um, like more oaths and schools and things like that. I know there's a lot of third party stuff out there that, that can be found too, but maybe some official stuff would be really cool. That's the big thing. I feel like that. That's the big thing. I feel like they've been missing. If you know, I like. Oh, I want to play this, and there is no option for that. So, more more character options. All right, Scott, real quick. Just real quick, I would like more world building options. More. Um, when I say world building options, I'm up to a. You know, I, so I've spent most of my time DMing, and the the point being is that. I would like a little bit more thought put between how the different multiverse within the D&D world, Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Dark Sun, and Planescape, and all these different things, how they fit together into a common framework. So I would like to see maybe, I, I don't know if it needs to be an additional source book or it needs to be something, but how is it that Grazit can, can exist in Forgotten Realms and in Greyhawk? how is it that you have the blood war going on in different areas so i would like maybe a little bit better i they started getting into some of it you know with um with um you know morning his tome of foes mm-hmm. talking about these large scale conflicts that are raging on throughout the multiverse i wouldn't mind to see a little bit more along that i don't know if we're, i don't think it requires a new edition but i think when they do put out a new edition i think or another source book for make it five, five, whatever the hell you want to call it. I would like to see a little more thought along the multiverse that is, that exists within the D and D side, you know, direct links between, you know, is Paylor really the equivalent of, you know, Lathander, right? These, these type of things and these type of lore, uh, um, you know, it's almost something like a manual of the planes or something like that to where you could, start transposing your players between one setting and another setting because what i always loved like was that space jammer or something like that yeah almost <laughs> space like jammer so uh so so like you know you have you know forgotten realms is more hopeful and optimistic um obviously ravenloft is is a gothic setting right uh greyhawk is a very um very dreary very depressing setting um, it was constructed in the seventies, of course. So, you, you know, the, the idea that you can have moods and feels and, and, and things like that, I would like further exploration than in that in the future editions. That's, I like to build worlds. So that's what I would like to see. I agree with Scott, you know, find a way to tie it all together. Yeah. Right. It sounds like <laughs> though, that you don't, you're right though. You would need a new edition. You just need more source books. Maybe, sure. maybe more source books. Maybe you don't need a new edition. Maybe so. It calls for. Yeah. Maybe sure. so. Yeah, guys, uh, 15 minutes over. So we are going to get to final thoughts real quick. A yay or nay on uh, whether, you know, fifth edition can keep going, trucking along for years as is whether you think there's going to be a 5.5 or whether you think sixth edition is maybe 
sooner than we might all think. And so with that, yeah, man, I'm bummed. I had a bunch of questions to ask you. <laughs> Once we got through the additions about, you know, what the 6E looks like, you know, do we still use the D20 or maybe we should go over to using D100s and percentage die and roll under skills or something crazy like that. I think we That'd need to great. add another show during the week. We <laughs> need to so. add another show on Thursday. There's nothing interesting going on. God damn it, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle. Uh, but real quick, is 5E going to continue to last? Is there going to be a 5.5? Or is six coming sooner than we all might think? Carol, you start off. Real quick answer. Okay, so five, uh, five, yes, five E will continue. Uh, no, I do not think there'll be a five point five, uh, and I don't think six E is going to arrive early. I mean, at least ten years. You know, ten years is where where I think a lot of systems go, and then they. As long as they can make money. Okay, let's face it; it's a business it's yes. about money. As long as they can keep coming out with source books, you know, and maybe if you suggest those source books, maybe they'll print them. Uh, they also seem to make a lot. They seem to make a lot on the um, like uh, um, the event, uh, the adventures, the big adventures like uh, Avernus and Curse Strahd and I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, Mad Mage. Uh, I know that those actually are pretty good sellers for them. So as long as it's supported, they're not going to go to a six, and I don't think there'll be a five point five. All this right, a- David, go. Sorry, Carol. Six no. edition. There's, if six edition comes along, it's going to be pie in the sky. It's going to give us everything that we want and tagline. I'm calling it right now. Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons. What's your story? There you go. Ooh, all just, right. Oh, uh, how uh, soon are we talking, uh, though, David? How long do I have to wait for this perfect Dungeons and Dragons? Probably forever. <laughs> forever. <laughs> so, all right. Not going to happen. <laughs> Um, five years will uh, will will probably hear an announcement for six O in in five years from now. In the meantime, we'll get we'll get a new source book or a new adventure every uh, twelve months to eighteen months, mm-hmm. and I think we'll get a new source book, a real source book, something along where you're going to tie the multiverse together, probably within the next eighteen months. Sure. All right. Mm-hmm. I mean, just to throw in my personal thing, and then we'll all wave and say goodbye. I think we were probably on the uh, brink of 5.5 right now, whether we decide to call it or not. And the reason I'm saying is because we're changing how races and how you build your character. And I think depending on what they do, that this might indeed be the iceberg into 5.5. Um, 60. Yeah, I'm definitely saying four or five more years away. I'm with you, Scott. Dave, I don't think it'll be perfect. (laughs) No, it's not. It never is. So, But yeah, hey, you know, here's to hoping that the next source book is a really good source book and they finally fix that damn ranger. Everybody, (laughs) wave to the camera, say goodbye. Thank you, Dirty Dog Dice and Don't Pirate Dog Dice and Odd Fish Games. I corrected myself. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.